Here we go. Part two. Kind of being mad about it. All right. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda Shattuck. I teach eighth grade math and science at Kaleidoscope Academy here in the district. This is my partner, Kelsey. Um, I teach uh, freshman math here at North. Um, and we actually met through our um, grad school program. Mm -hmm. um, and as we were working through our grad school, we realized that we operate in very similar ways. <laughs> and so as we were starting to transition into standards based, it made sense that we would work together because we both teach algebra. Um, and to just have someone to bounce ideas off of and philosophies and it was it was very, very helpful. So this is essentially our journey over the last year and a half, two years. Yeah. And although it's geared towards <coughs> more mathematics, we're gonna try and communicate to you um, so you can apply it to your subject areas as well, because we know that there's not all of you that teach math in here. So hopefully you can take some bits and pieces away and apply it to your curriculum as well. Um, first, we're going to be using this vocabulary a lot, and we know that a lot of people use it in a lot of different ways. So we just want to be very transparent and clear about um, how we use it in our classroom. Not saying it's the one right way, but just so that we're all clear as we're moving forward what we're saying. Um, our learning targets are kind of what we want students to take out of the class daily or um, over the course of two or three days. So those those smaller ideas. Um, in my classroom, I describe them as like rungs on a ladder. You're trying to get to the top of the ladder, which is the standard, and every rung is a learning target on your way there. Um, our power standards are those overarching topics that um, students really need to know before they leave algebra or before they leave whatever. Um, content area you're in. Um, vertical alignment is something we'll talk about a lot at the beginning um, and how it was so crucial to our planning um, and to make sure that we were really giving our students the curriculum that we wanted to. Vertical alignment um, would be the idea that we worked with upper and lower level teachers to help make sure that we were um, aligned in what we were doing and what we were focusing on. And finally spiraling, we'll get into detail about this. But this is the idea of bringing concepts back throughout a class. Um, so they might see a standard on assessment one, and assessment five, and assessment seven um, to kind of increase retention and help them be able to see connections that can be made throughout the class. <coughs> so the beginning, how it all started. Uh, we realized that she was teaching algebra and I was teaching algebra, but we were not teaching the same thing. <laughs> and so. Um, uh, well, again, we're try we'll try not to get too math specific, but really, the al eighth grade algebra has a, has a different textbook than high school algebra, um, and <laughs> which is frustrating. It's frustrating. <laughs> um, so frustrating. We, we, thought, we thought, yeah, yeah we <laughs> thought, wow, okay, let's just get everything out on the table. So essentially, we took every and this might not be the right way, but this worked very well for us because we're very detail-oriented and we like to see everything. So we came up with every learning target we could from our textbook, from what um, Appleton says is taught in algebra, and from Common Core. And we got a disgusting list. <laughs> and from those learning targets, we pulled out um, also key vocabulary. And what we did with both of those is essentially we shuffled them up to all of our upper level math teachers at North and said, what's really, really important? Um, so obviously you can't, you can touch on all of those things, but you can't hit them with the depth that you want to. And it, it, you can't assess all of those things. And so as you can see, it got kind of messy, but we, we sent this out and said, okay, here's how it would break down within our units. Highlight your top 10 vocabulary words. You want to make sure we're using that. You want to make sure students are using that we should be assessing. We did the same thing with learning targets. So here's how our learning targets break down um, in our classes. Bold two in every unit. And the conversations were amazing. I mean, just vocabulary alone, they're like, okay, well, I want this word, but really we should be saying this tweak on it. Um, or, this learning target is not hit hard enough. And if we had been doing it on our own, some of the ones that they told us to focus on were things that I know I had been deliberately skimming. 
Like I had been deliberately saying, okay, if I don't have time for that, that's fine. Because I couldn't see how it interconnected, but they could eventually. And what's cool about this whole vertical alignment piece and talking to the other grade levels is the idea of, um, you know, what truly to focus on and then in turn what the students were internalizing. So I know at our building um, and in our class, vocabulary was huge. It was our CSIP goal for the year to touch on. And so um, the more that I took time to look at the list that was highlighted by the other math teachers, um, really allowed me to start to see that interconnectedness of how these vocabulary terms were important. But then also kind of looking at the other piece to it is the students and how they were internalizing it. So I think a lot of what this grading for learning and standards-based grading is getting at is really allowing the students to take ownership of their understanding and of their progress in the material that you are covering with them. And then a lot of different pieces, not just in the vocabulary, you'll be kind of hearing us refer to getting students to take ownership. And what was neat about this vocab is the amount of time that we spent to go in depth at, in these particular terms later on or in a good amount of time, you would hear the students start to talk and use these vocabulary terms in their language, in their descriptive writing, if that was being asked of them on an assessment. And so they were taking it to that next level without us saying, you like all the time, yes, we would remind them that they should be referring to their vocab, but they were doing it on their own almost eventually. And then that's where those rich conversations came in for Kelsey and I with our students to get to know them more as learners and where they were in their progress of understanding when it came time for assessments. So we saw it both ways in terms of prepping to prepare them, but then the end result in them showing their actual knowledge and understanding of the material, which was nice to see. It was a nice reward for us. And I definitely saw a change in myself as far as, especially in regards to the vocabulary, the learning targets that also helped me just plan and be very deliberate and thoughtful about what I was doing. Um, but in terms of vocabulary, my tendency was always to communicate it in a way that everybody will understand. So when I'm talking about a fraction, the top number and the bottom number versus the numerator and the denominator. But because I was formatively assessing, I was doing vocabulary activities, I was trying to assess on these often, um, I had to use numerator and denominator or they weren't going to be prepared for it. Um, so it really helped me be a lot more uh, deliberate about the language that I was using in order to prepare them, not just to use the easiest words for them to get it right away. And not to say that it's, you know, it's going to help them for the future math courses, but I was also talking to our um, tech um, <coughs> ed teacher at our building and just some of the common words, you know, like formula, even though it's not one that we hit specifically on or slope um, that they do use in their tech ed classes. So not only is it used in our math curriculum, but it can be applied to the other um, disciplines as well. And it was interesting, you know, hearing from him how much they couldn't apply that knowledge in what they were learning about in their tech ed class, you know, in setting up their game or whatever it is that they were doing. It's just like, why not? Because we hit that so hard. And so taking time to reflect more on that this year and finding ways to assess and get a deeper level of understanding with our vocab has really panned out and has helped. Mm -hmm. But overall, the vertical alignment piece was crucial for our planning. Um, so essentially what we tried to do then, and for some of you who are, already have um, standards that you know you have to hit in your class, this may not be as applicable, um, but what we did is we took our learning targets um, and we thought about how we wanted our units to go. We tried to be very thoughtful about our textbook and make sure that we were using our textbook as a resource and not as our curriculum. Um, and we started to imagine, okay, what would what would our ideal textbook look like? What does our curriculum look like? And we broke down, um, we started with our units and thought, okay, what topics do we want to touch on first so that students are introduced to the vocabulary they're going to be using continuously? Um, and then we filtered and put our learning targets um, into, the, into the units that we thought they fit. Well, and as you said before, you know, we had our two textbooks. We had the district's information about what it is and the Common Core. And sometimes they all met on the same level as to a standard. And sometimes one standard was more descriptive on, you know, the district's page versus in the Common Core. So it really um, challenged us to pare down our learning targets, even though we do plan on using them because they are very specific and they let the students know what it is we want to cover. 
but we needed to find a way to more assess the overarching standard and not each learning target because I think that allowed the students to be or understand the information somewhat in a more disconnected manner than what we wanted them to be able to do eventually in the end was compare the different types of functions or contrast them. Um, and so that moving into this, you know, moving towards the major common core standards or the overarching standards has definitely helped us um, right. in terms of assessing, which we'll get to in a little bit. Absolutely, it absolutely, because initially we started by assessing learning targets. Yeah, that was our summative assessment. It was a lot. It was a lot. And we also realized, like Amanda just said, it was really disconnected. And you can't assess multiple times on all of these. It just it doesn't work. And um, so this kind of helped us transition into, okay, we want to assess, we should be assessing standards because that's what we want students to come away with, those standards. That's why they're there. This is the progression to get to them, but we should be summatively assessing on the standards. And this should be your formatives, your exit slips, your Google quizzes, that sort of stuff. Um, and then we, so as you can see, we got, we started very specific and then we got very broad. Um, so from these standards, we started to kind of look at uh, what were our commonalities, what were our common themes, what did we want students to be doing over and over and over and over again using different tools. Um, and so that's where we came up with our power standards which we um, <coughs> tried to keep around the five number or under um, just to make grading manageable and to be really thoughtful. Are those yeah. letters district or? No, these are state. common core. Common core, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so again, to try to think of our power standards not as units, but as what we wanted students to be doing over and over and over and over again. In, in the class. Okay. Yep, and then so when we put this newer spreadsheet that's on the bottom together, um, when you looked at the different units and at the different common core standards that were being asked throughout each unit, we came up with these four power standards words in, in terms of when they were asking us to uh, you know, cover these power standards, we were getting at more of having the students try to interpret. Um, and then obviously the reasoning, modeling, building came from there. So it kind of lent itself to creating our power standards or what we wanted to call definitely. them. It wasn't that we just pulled them out of thin air. Right. We definitely were thoughtful as to what the different standards were kind of being paired together and what they were asking students to do to come up with that power standard. Um, just to kind of recap on the language so that we're very clear about what we're doing. We try to come up with a generic, not just a math example. Um, so if you think about your subject, our example is childhood. Our power standard would be something you do throughout childhood over and over and over again. So outdoor activities, something broad. Um, a standard would be that you can ride a bike. And then your learning target building up to that would be a tricycle. So most kids, most parents don't say, I think you can ride a tricycle. Like the goal, the standard is that they can ride a bike, right? You want your kid to learn how to ride a bike. This is a way to get there. And you might have, obviously, more learning targets than that. Absolutely. That standard, <laughs> yeah. But you're formatively assessing those learning targets and then eventually summatively assessing that standard in the end. Um, so that was our big planning and how we prepped for the, um, this last year and a little bit um, some tweaks that we made throughout. Uh, and then what we did with that is we took that and tried to create our units. And we broke it down by power standards, the standards that were included. Um, and you're, we're not always going to assess a full standard. I mean, these are huge. Um, so we're not, we try to make notes of that. We're only going to assess this first portion in this unit. We'll hit the other portion in unit five or wherever it is. Now, I feel like we had to cover the whole thing because it didn't make sense. Um, we broke, broke it down on our learning targets. If you look at the back of our learning targets, um, those are actually levels of Bloom's taxonomy. To try to be really thoughtful that we were um, hitting the basic stuff and hitting the complex stuff and not breaking it down too minutely. Um, and then this is the vocabulary that we wanted to make sure that we were hitting and formatively assessing throughout the year. Um, <laughs> and then this is our revamped assessment. Um, these are kind of what our assessments look like. We try to assess 
um, about twice or every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, this is the standard that we're assessing. And again, like we talked about, we started by assessing learning targets and it was messy and it didn't make sense and the kids weren't making any connections. And it was really hard to, to assign a rubric score for the different types, the of, problems, different types like, of problems. Because, because like a, a beginning problem on our assessment might be define this term, right? Very straightforward. But then we could also have a really complex create your own word problem that does this. And to grade both of those on the same four point scale was really very confusing. Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense to give a four for a definition and then to also give a four to be able to create your own word problem. It didn't match up. So what we did is we switched to um, DOK levels. So that's one standard, this idea of, looks like it's um, working with linear functions. Um, we broke it down into the DOK level, so you can just graph a basic function. Now you can graph a more complicated one. Now you can apply that knowledge and information. Now you can create something with it. And what we do is we look at this section holistically and grade this on a rubric. So there's only one rubric score for that standard. So it's a much more holistic grading than what we were doing before. So are those weighted? Or? No, there's no weight. So we'll, we just look at, we look at everything. So we'll grade it, and we both use a highlighter method, so we'll highlight and correct problems. And then we'll look at the standard as a whole. And then using our proficiency rubric, we'll say they are a three, depending on this. And this has really kind of pushed us out of our comfort <coughs> zone in a way that, um, I mean, we're both willing to take the risk, but for us, you know, Growing up, it was always about getting the correct answer in math or showing, you know, how you could get that correct answer. And we had to take a step back from that, and it's more about the student's work and progress and their showing of understanding of how to approach a problem. And so putting that right answer aside, looking at the proficiency rubric, and we'll kind of show you what we've kind of developed um, in terms of a 4 through 2 one scale, um, but it's just allowed us to have a better and clearer understanding of our learners and who they are as individual learners, not if they can get a certain number of points on an assessment. So this has really gotten us away from thinking about assigning points. And you had mentioned this in the earlier session, you know, in past um, years, you know, you look through a class and you take off points here and there, and then you get to the next class that you're assessing, and then you have to remember, well, how many points did I take off in class one? Because if those two students start talking to each other, and I took off three points for one student on this problem versus you know, a point for this student, you're gonna have some controversy. And, and it so, feels a little out of control, right? Like, yeah, you take like, points off, and then you average it, and that's the score they get. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes I was like, oh, that doesn't match up. Maybe I took too many points off here, maybe I took too many, or I didn't take enough off here. Like, how did they get that high of the grade? They didn't understand it very well. Like, it didn't always, it felt a little out of my control um, as far as where the grade was coming from. I felt like I wasn't able to use my expertise of what I was seeing. Um, and this feels more authentic. And students, too, I think, even though they didn't outwardly say it, we would catch a couple of those students that you know, either came up to us or were talking when we had time to go over the assessments in class about, you know, so I understand that I got this part in this level incorrect, but I started this correctly. And so they were able to kind of more justify as to what they knew versus didn't know and what they needed to focus on because they knew if this was like the first time we assessed the standard, they knew this standard was going to come up at least two or three more times in the near future for them to show their understanding of. Um, because like we'll talk about in a little bit of our spiraling concept that we wanted to put into the curriculum. But um, it just, this way of assessing, looking at DOK levels, the depths of knowledge, really put into perspective, you know, that progression of learning for the students. Um, and then again, going back to what I mentioned, the vocabulary piece, them talking about their learning, them pinpointing in their assessments what they could and could not do yet and what they needed to focus on for the future. Mm -hmm. And so based on this quiz, this is this is a proficiency rubric we've developed for next year. Um, and like an earth-shattering idea that hit me about halfway through last year was that I was still kind of using these as points 
I was still kind of, I was doing 4321, but I was still kind of thinking about it as, as points for some reason. And, and a big shift was that this is, these are all levels of proficiency. So a one is still some proficiency. This is still a level of proficiency. This is not that you get a one for writing something on your test. This is you have to show these things. You have to be able to do these things in regards to the standard. Um, and moving up the ladder. <laughs> and so if a student on that assessment has not shown proficiency on that standard, we need to have something to write for that. Um, which in this case we chose insufficient evidence. Some people use zero. Some people, I mean you could use a multitude of things. Um, but there needs to be a way for us to show there is no proficiency here at this point or based on this assessment. And then this um, NA not assessed is what we would use for like a reporting period if we haven't assessed on that standard yet. If, we haven't, if it's something that's gonna be covered in quarter three and we're, we're reporting on quarter one. <coughs> um, I guess we'll kind of skip over this because we're getting an analysis, but this, we made our own grade book. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. Um, and then like Amanda already touched on, really the most important part we found in all of this of standards-based grading or grading for learning or whatever you want to call it, is that we really want kids to take ownership. We want them to be able to look at what they're doing in class, identify what they're doing incorrectly, and make the correct moves to improve. Like We want that to happen. That's why we're trying to be really transparent and clear and organized, because we want them to be able to own what they're doing in our class and not say, you didn't tell us that. I didn't know that was going to be on the quiz. You know, we want them to be able to do it. Um, so <coughs> we're just going to talk about how we prepped them, essentially. Yep. So um, one thing that came up majorly this year when we talked about is, OK, so we know math takes practice um, over time and that repeated practice. But we kind of found from you know some preliminary research and obviously our own observations that students weren't always doing the practice and sometimes it was, it was out of our control. Um, you know you can't sit down next to them or force them to write and you can't follow them home. Um, so what we put in place is anytime that we learned a new learning target um, to meet a standard, we did offer some sort of practice and we called it 20 minutes of practice. We asked them that when we would be sending practice problems home, that they would devote 20 solid minutes of their time to completing that work. Um, we didn't require that they had to get through problems one through 10. We didn't require that they had to do specific ones. It was you sit down and do 20 minutes, you can skip through. If the beginning problems are easy for you, you can skip to the harder concepts if you know how to do those and vice versa. So it was really kind of putting them in control of practicing what it is or what we were doing that day or two days if it took that long. Um, but we knew that we couldn't just leave it up to them entirely um, because we do know and did realize that there were some students that did put that off or did not do that practice. But it was another way for us to say, you know, this is what we provided for you. We encourage you to do it to be able to show your understanding or if you know that the standard's coming up in the future, then you can go back to it. Um, I worked a lot with Google Classroom, I'm sure you all have this year. So it's kind of nice for me. I could push this information out to them. And if they didn't do that well in an assessment, I could say go back to this day where I assigned it. There's practice problems for you there. If you didn't get through all of them, do the ones you didn't do. Or if you didn't do it, do it. Um, but to hold then everybody accountable, we um, sent them a spiral practice worksheet. The first five problems are on here. It was no more than 10 problems. But everybody was required to do this, and we gave them a week to do it in. So it was very feasible for them to do 10 problems in a week, or it should have been. Um, obviously, you can see that some are highlighted. The ones that are completely white, those are problems that were either concepts that were kind of um, more eighth grade material that were building up for students that hopefully that we could show them the connection that to as how it was going to relate to future um, learning concepts, or they were concepts that we had just currently introduced that weren't going to be quite introduced or assessed on the coming up um, assessment. The ones that are grayed out are actual problems or problems that they would um, be seeing on an assessment. So we typically we found what was kind of easy for us, if we could keep it, 
we assigned this on a Thursday. It wasn't due until the next Thursday. And then our assessment would be on the Friday. So they knew that if they completed anything that was in the gray, they would see problems like that on their assessment for the Friday. It wasn't, we never saw this as teaching to the test. Um, again, it was our way of being transparent for the students so they knew exactly what the learning targets were that were going to be coming up, and I should say standards, what standards would be assessed so they knew what to hone in on in their studying. And then on the bottom, obviously it's not there, but on the bottom, it would tell them the actual standard that those grayed out boxes related to. So as we were having them, we'll talk about in a little bit, um, track their own progress. Um, they could go back to seeing what exact standard they needed to look at, prepare for, and get ready for that assessment. So this was, we use it for a lot of different things, obviously, but number one, it's a retention tool to help them retain information over a long period of time. Number two is a communication tool to let them know exactly what was going to be spiraled on the next assessment. To give you kind of an idea of like, what we mean by spiraling, um, if we have quiz one, Quiz one might have only standard two and five on it. Um, quiz two might have standard two, five, and seven. And quiz three might have five, seven, and oops, five, nine, and seven. Um, so essentially we try to hit each standard multiple times. And we wanted to make sure we weren't just pulling from first semester and throwing it on second semester. We wanted to make sure we were being um, very deliberate about how we were spiraling this information and uh, communicating it. So this was just one way that we communicated what standard they received next. So it wasn't, surprise, this is also on your assessment, I hope you remember it. And the last piece that it kind of helped was, I know we wrote it in our caption for this, uh, this session, was um, moving away from retakes. So this spiraling concept allowed us to not have to come up with our retake policy and create an entire new assessment so students could retake it um, or didn't have to answer the questions, can I just retake this one problem because it's the only thing that I messed up on this assessment. Um, what this spiraling does is it allows the students to see exactly what standard is going to be assessed on the next assessment. So if they didn't do that well previously, um, they know that that is a standard to focus on, hone in on, to make better for the next time. And um, also, let's say maybe the third time they assessed, they didn't do that well. Um, we have other things in place, or that's a, that case by case situation where you do just work with that student to see what it is, what that misconception is, so that that um, last or the third time that you assessed it that semester or whatever doesn't throw off their total overall score. So part of it is you knowing your students, obviously, as well, or a lot of it. Not I think we've learned is knowing your students as learners and, and what they do need. Um, but having the opportunity to spiral standards like this has really given us a time to move away from that retake policy and really put the ownership on the student to focus on what it is they need to know and learn and understand for the upcoming assessment because they know it's going to happen. Right. So like my response to can I retake this is every quiz is a retake because they're going to see it again. And I. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is a lot of work to put together and be thoughtful about and to make a plan so that you're assessing every standard three times. But my conversations at the end of the year with freshmen, mind you, were, um, Miss V, because I have we have them track their progress, um, Miss V, this standard is hurting my grade, but I think I learned it. I did all this practice. Is this going to be on the next quiz? Or when are we going to see this again? Because they knew they wanted to show their learning. They could pinpoint what they were not doing well on. They did the work to do it, and now they wanted to be reassessed to show me that they knew it. And to me, that was like the holy grail of math. Well, <laughs> well it, it just I validated, judgment. I think, everything that we had put into place. Obviously, you know, you try your best, and not every student's going to come up to you and say those things to you. But when you hear that from a student, that just reaffirms um, what you are doing or part of what you're doing is on some sort of a right track. Obviously, we're not saying this is the DL end all. You'll have access to this presentation after this, but it's what we found to work for us, at least for the starting point. There's a lot of things that we had to retweak, right? We start to retweak for next year. I'm totally revamp. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. We have our own folder, revamp next year. But I mean, it's just hearing those things from your students that just validates this whole thing for you. So let's say a student like 
kind of came along. They're like, I never hit two. I just kept doing bad, but I feel like I know it. And it's not spiraled on or rolled on to what you're doing. Would you then let them maybe reassess? And that yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if a student is able to identify what they've not done well on, it comes to you and says, I feel like I know this now. I feel like I could sit down with them, create three problems, and say, all right, show me that. You know, it, it's, it feels a little bit more authentic, and it's a little bit more case by case. I feel like we would never, I don't think either of us, if they've done the, the like work, I don't think any of us would say, no, it's not on the next quiz. And these ones are not optional on the quiz. Like, they can't be like, I know I've done poorly on this standard, and so I know that it's going to be on here. They could do those problems, but not the other ones. But not the other ones, or would yeah. you just say you have to do all? They're taking the quiz. Yep. <laughs> well, and part of it too is we're math people. We we want multiple data points. Like we don't want it's, we don't want a one and done on the standard. Um, because did they memorize it the night before, or like do they know it? <laughs> right. True. And, yeah. So we we have to have multiple data points just for our own. And I I use a decaying average, so. They do poorly and but show their mastery over time, their grade goes up effectively. Yeah, and at Kaleidoscope this year, we were the only middle school to do standards based, but we elected to do the power law through Infinite Canvas. Um, I did not like that as much just because it was a, um, it showed their, Projector. yeah, it projected that sort of, yep, it projected their score. So a student that had a 433. Projected lower than a student who started at a one and then got a three three. They projected them higher because it was like it. The power law is assuming what their next score would be. Um, so that was a little kind of trying. So when we did report out, it was mostly me going back into the gradebook and overriding based on what I thought and what the students had showed me for that semester. So there's some obviously things that we can't quite control, and depending on what the new LMS, we don't know if it's got the option of decaying average, power law, or what's going to be decided, but um, yeah, make it's it work. kind of what we, what we did yeah, to make it work this year. Um, this is not a version that we like, but is a version that we started with as far as the progress tracker. Um, we wanted students to be able to see their progression over time on the formatives, on the, uh, or on the learning targets, those things leading up to the standard and the standard. Um, so students would get an assessment back and they would input their scores and it color codes so they can see if they're in the red zone, the yellow zone, the green zone, and hopefully see growth over time. So this is where those conversations usually stem from. Like, Ms. V, I'm not doing well on this one. Could you work with me on this? Um, and also just inform conversations during lunch and study hall and um, like IE time when they could come in and sound like, I need help in that, or I want to raise my grade. It's like we can pull this up, we can look at exactly what they need, we can give them that practice. Um, it just helped really pinpoint those conversations. It's not where we want, it's not real pretty. It's a little overwhelming initially. <laughs> and we want to incorporate um, some graphing so that they can visually see that progression and, and hopefully the growth and give them multiple ways to, to see it. But it's a start to kind of build that ownership in. So then, again, the major point, or the greatest point, I guess, um, with grade threatening is really getting the students to take ownership of their learning. And so we felt that to keep that in the forefront of the students' um, minds, we wanted them to continue to reflect. I mean, we are asked to reflect, and I know sometimes we don't like it, um, and you can tell that sometimes the students don't, but we really think that this has lent itself to making this successful. Um, for the students, and this is obviously like everything else, something we want to tweak. But um, before every unit and at the end of every unit, we ask students to make a commitment, and then at the end, reflect upon their commitment in terms of what they thought um, of the different attributes of giving effective effort. Um, so the first three are time, focus, and uh, resourcefulness. Um, but these are attributes that we were introduced to in our grad school class that really um, stuck with us in one of our courses and thought, well, this is something that we could really encourage the students to be cognizant of as we go through the different um, standards that we are asking them to complete this year. And so what we would like to do is continue this, but maybe through a Google form or whatnot, but it, it just is another way for us to 
get to know our students as learners um, and not just math learners. Get to know a more holistic view um, on them. And part of our beginning kind of, of getting ready for all this is we really do take time with growth mindset. Um, to walk through these different six attributes and really help them understand what they mean and what they should mean for them. So when it comes time to do a reflection like this, it's not something new. It's not something that we have to walk them through every single time. It's going to become more automated throughout the rest of the year, um, but something that we want to give time for them to do because it allows them, it kind of puts that assessment piece into perspective. It allows them to communicate about that assessment either in writing or if you know they do have that confidence to come up with, up to us and verbally talk about what it is they felt for this unit or the standards that we covered. Mm -hmm. And it, it took away the, sorry, yeah. we're working on taking away the whole, I worked on that project for three hours last week. Yeah. And really they were on their phone and then they were like on YouTube for a little bit and then they were Snapchatting and then like they went and got a snack and then they, you know, so to have this verbiage, effective effort, like how much would you say that was effective effort? Yeah, it's like maybe 20 minutes. You know, <laughs> it just, it helped to kind of, you know, hear the conversation instead of saying, oh yeah, really did you? You know, it kind of helped make it a little bit more productive conversation. Um, these are some of the many, many tweaks that we want to make for next year. Um, just to continually experiment with accountability <clears throat> measures. So um, I didn't take points off for late things. So if I did a project, a summative project in geometry, um, and a student wasn't ready to present on their project, I didn't take points off. So to experiment with how I could still hold the students accountable, um, was it interesting? Uh, what I found that worked really well for me because I'm a freshman team teacher, so I have their lunch hours off, is that they then had to eat their lunch in my classroom until their project was ready. Um, um, so that's a convenience for me that's not allowed for everybody. I know some other teachers in our building are experimenting with um, some like study hall lunch hours. So maybe they'll get into a team of four and if they if one of them supervises a lunch hour that team of four teachers they have students with late work will send those students in during that lunch hour um, until they're done um, and then if not then that becomes another that becomes a behavior with a behavioral consequence with a meeting with the dean with a potential like real lunch um, but just kind of not automatically saying well now i can't hold students accountable but experimenting with, well, how can I behaviorally hold them accountable for a behavioral issue when it's a work in progress? <laughs> um, and it is continually increase student ownership to work on our reflection pieces, to make them authentic, to help students connect them. Um, we started using Google Forms. We use the paper, effective effort. Um, we tried to reflect in front of the students so they saw us modeling that. We helped them reflect on our teaching and give us feedback so they could see how it could go a multitude of different ways. And just making sure we don't push that to the side because, you know, like I said, we take a lot of time at the beginning of the year to set them straight on what those effective effort terms are, how we go about the reflection. But yes, trying to get it so it's more. Um, automated throughout the year, but that it's worth it. And that's not just, okay, go do it, get it done, and, you know, check, it's, it's done. So making sure that we are, like Kelsey said, modeling for them, that it does matter, um, that we want to know about you and how you understand yourself as a learner so it is meaningful for them in their learning. Um, clear communication on grading, I think that just goes back to taking our learning targets that were so nitty gritty, even though that's how our mind works, but making it more looking in terms of uh, assessing the standards holistically, but still allowing the students to see those nitty gritty details so they know what all goes into that. Um, and just being clear on how we get that information out to them in terms of whatever <laughs> grading process that we will be eventually putting it into Infinite Campus or what, what has been decided eventually down the road. So just being clear, being transparent, that has been very important, something that we've seen throughout this process that we have gone through this past year. Um, and then formative assessments. We started out, I think, doing fairly well and they were kind of iffy throughout the year, but 
just for every learning target, we really want to be mindful of having a paired formative assessment with that. So the students can track their progress. We can see their progress throughout those nitty gritty details leading up to a summative. So it's not that we're catching um, they're learning at the summative where some issue is happening, that it is that we see somewhere along the way. And that I think in times of when we have found time to do that, um, you know, making sure it's in our plans, but then we have been able to find ways of, of you know, forming groups to help those students to remediate or finding ways for if students really understood, finding a tool or a technology tool to kind of get them off and running either on more challenging, deeper problems or the next step um, in the process of their learning or uh, us meet with a group quickly to touch base on those quick mistakes and then get them going. And then us having time to sit down with those groups to actually meet us walking through with them or giving them more specific notes or whatever it may be. So formatives, I think, are very key that can sometimes be put on the side burner, um, but they obviously inform the student's learning and eventually feed into their, their summative assessment score. So how do you grade those? Say that. How do you grade those? Um, so we we do uh, 4, 3, 2, 1 on them. On some, some, like some of them, if they're a little bit more heavily, Sometimes if they're exit slip tickets, I've made piles like the student, if I haven't seen anything, I kind of assess them the same with highlighting. Um, so we both found this um, online, I forget what the source was, it's terrible of me, I shouldn't know my sources, but um, we saw one school where they highlight where their first mistake was being made and then handing it back to the students. So it's putting ownership on them, trying to figure out why we highlighted that mistake in terms of was it a multiplication error, was it um, something in the process of them um, completing the problem, whatever it may be, and then handing it back to them to have that discussion with like people. So I found myself kind of creating um, three different piles, one where I didn't have to make any highlighting mistakes, um, a pile that if I did, it was like where I knew it was those quick kind of multiplication errors or something that they missed a negative sign or something like that for them to figure out or me to touch base with them quickly. And then the more highlight mistakes that I knew was more of a process or misunderstanding that completely threw them off or they just didn't get it. So then I could, you know, send those students off who were ready to move on, um, meet with those students quickly who needed just a one touch. I think it was more of your negative sign or whatever. And then I could sit down with that other group and really sadly walk through the process with them. I think the key um, is using them for something the next day. Yes. Because because they're not they're not summative, so we don't we right. don't use them for their grade at all. Nope. They're not scored, they're not for the grade book. The students track them, but none of that is hap like okay, that's what none of it is towards the grade. But our neither of us had any issues with students not taking them seriously. And I think it's because um, we unknowingly did this. <laughs> and the next day, they could very clearly see where where they were placed and why. Um, so they saw how those were used the next day. Um, and the same thing if we do like a Google quiz. So then I can throw up like the, the graphic, like the pie graphic and say, okay, we all got number five wrong. So that's what we're going to start with today. Mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that they could see exactly how it was used. Um, I mean, I had students asking, like, will you write me a late pass? I need to finish this. I'm like, it's an exit ticket. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, sure, why not? Um, so they, they actually took it very seriously. I mean, we made them very short. They were maybe three to five questions, mm -hmm. maybe. Sometimes just one. Yeah, quick checks for understanding. Um, but yeah, like you said, the key was using them in some way, shape, or form for the next day whether it was whole group or individual groups. And when it was individual groups, you could tell that they knew that that's how that they would be somewhat divided up and they really took it seriously. I mean, not that, not that we're trying to show like, well, you guys need a lot right. of help. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried to be very cognizant and deliberate about how we did it in our classroom. Yeah. Um, but they all wanted to be on their technology. And essentially that was the enrichment group, usually, just because those students were ready to move on without us. Um, and so they got to go work on their Chromebooks on whatever we had the task of the day was. Um, and everybody else wanted to get started on that because they knew it was happening. And being on my Chromebook is way better than talking to you. And so <laughs> and so they, they wanted to get there. So they wanted to do well. But we, I mean, we could go on and on and on about what we want to um, 
change. <laughs> but, but are there any other questions? I do want to give some time for that. Really like oh the emergency room. Yeah, that was. I, I like that how it broken down. Okay, and it was something we struck like we struggled putting that together, and it, it took a lot of time. <laughs> But we wanted something that was broad enough that we didn't have to create a rubric for every single standard because obviously you all have your own standards, but in, in math too, there is just so many. And it's like to have the time to try and sit and think of a standard for, or a rubric for this one and this one and then try and keep it all straight and then That's you know tell parents about that and why hard. this one's different versus this one. And yeah, we try to keep it broad. That it could meet all standards. So, well done. Well, thank you. <laughs> is that 20 minutes of practice? Is that the only homework that y'all give them? Mm -hmm. okay, so they have. What? Where did you say? Usually five to ten problems. No, I usually give like a like like 30. Mm -hmm. 30 say, well, because okay. we I wanted to have a a nice sampling, so they're usually progressive worksheets. Um, it looks like you're really creative. But it's usually like a progressive worksheet, and there's probably 30 problems. So like we say five like, problems from the first. Like if you're going to cover three sections, you should do like maybe 10, 10, and 10, or something like that. Or I don't really. I use my textbook more so as a resource to pull activities from. So most of my homework comes online. A lot of it is CUDA, um, which is a great math resource for worksheets. Um, but yeah, I think you could break it apart by sections. Um, we try not to give anything that is too application-based outside of class, depending on where we are in the learning target. Um, but it's progressive, so we say we want you to work on this for 20 minutes. If you try the first two problems and they're a breeze, flip to the back. Try the first two on the back. If those are a breeze, start from the bottom and work your way back. Um, and to try to, again, create that sort of ownership, like, where are you? You decide. What, what do you need right now? And to get them used to, in class, work on the hardest problem first so that we can help you while you're here and you have resources. Only I could get that. That's, that's a, that is a battle in and of itself. Right. It took, to it took the whole them. year. Start with the Just hardest start problem. Start with the hardest <laughs> job so we can help you here. Yeah. Right. And how are those graded? Similar to the assessment. They're not, they're not at all. Um, so something I said in the last portion, so I, I used Google Classroom a lot to send those out. Um, and I know I have to get a little bit better at looking at more of the results in a little bit more depth than I did. Um, I just didn't find time in my schedule yeah, to do that. But sometimes when I, when I was mindful of that, I either picked a certain problem that I knew would be probably more difficult for the mass of the class and hopefully that they got to that problem or it was um, one that if I did say focus on this section for the day because this is what we covered that they got to that and kind of trying to figure out um, you know where the mistakes will had lied for most of my students um, other times I would kind of look through to see how many problems that some students did actually get through um, if they did stick more towards the top or if they did challenge themselves with the bottom just so it was more informing my understanding of my students, not their score. Um, and then that's kind of where I took it for the next day or if I needed to go over that specific <laughs> problem I picked up the night before, we did that as a whole class or we did it as a section where the students I could tell really had some issues with, we went over that problem. And we tried to be cognizant of the fact that some students didn't need to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there's a portion of our class that doesn't, didn't need that extra practice on that particular learning target. Um, and then I used my, our IE time. So if a student was continually struggling on a formative on a certain learning target, I pulled them in and we did the practice together, even if they'd already done it or hadn't done it. Okay, I understand these things aren't graded. You know, so if you're using Google Quiz, it's going to give them their score and they can just refer to that on their own. But did you keep track of these kids are doing this and turning this in and these kids aren't? Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like, yes, I did not because I, I was trying to, I was trying to hammer home the fact, like, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. You have to do enough to learn it. You have to do enough to learn it. Do enough work to learn it. So figure out what the work is that you need to do to learn the material and do that. Um, 
because it was just it just felt like not a good use of my time to be walking around the classroom for how long to check off it was completed if they copied it from their friend in the hallway. Mm -hmm. It just felt like, and like the kids who didn't need to do it were then doing it. And the kids who weren't still weren't doing it. And, yeah. and so it yeah. just, I was like, this doesn't mesh with what I'm trying to communicate, <laughs> which is do enough to learn the material. Because really, if I'm checking off or not checking off, then the kids who want the check mark are just going to get the check mark. And mm -hmm. it just, it, it wasn't meshing. So it was. It's a hard thing to communicate to parents. It well, really hard. I'm not gonna. Say, so I, <laughs> sure, I it. did <laughs> keep track of who did because I was sending things out through Google Classroom. You can quickly, obviously, see who turned something in and who didn't. So I would make sure and go through that they actually had shown proof of their work. So I sent out like the worksheets or whatever we had them do, and then I had them take a snapshot of their notebook for the problems that they did and upload to Google Classroom. And I did keep track of that, but it wasn't for the score. It went in as a formative. Um, assessment, have you will, even though I wasn't formatively assessing, I said sometimes I should have done a little bit better, sometimes I just looked for, turned in, turned in, but the piece that did help me communicate was to the parents. So like when the parents like, how come my student is getting, um, you know, twos in this standard and the student hadn't come up to talk to me or, you know, I had tried to touch base with them here and there, I could refer back to that information in my campus and say, well, they did not focus on these problems for the section that was necessary to help them on the standard. So I will say that that was a piece that was helpful for me to communicate to parents. But, you know, like Kelsey was saying, the kids that I know that could just do it and understood it, they were just doing it and they were more worried about getting it turned in. And then they're coming up to me, I have play practice and I have soccer and this and that. I just like, just breathe. I know I'm going to do it. Like, it's okay. I have so, a, a new idea that I might try this year, which is like a an evidence folder and so just to have them store evidence of their understanding um, to like inform those conversations have them keep it in the classroom so that I also have some of that information like not backup but kind of backup yeah. and you have you it know. all digitally if you need it if, if mm -hmm. Jimmy comes to you and say, says this and you can pull up this whatever it is even mm -hmm. if you didn't mark it in <laughs> campus Anybody else to see right that say but you didn't do what I asked mm -hmm. you to do or, or what I gave you right that you could have used to practice mm -hmm. you know so you have it. So what I guess it's answer, just reporting to the parents. What does your internet campus look like? Um, you know, it's not real pretty right now. Daily grades. I I'm processing and trying to come up with a grade out of this. Mm -hmm. Right. So well, we what I grades. did is I had um I had that I had that crazy spreadsheet grade book. Yep. Um, and what and the students have their student tracker, and that's my best way to communicate with parents. So they share the student tracker with me and their parents, so we have access to that. So that's kind of the parents' new infinite campus. That's where they're seeing everything. And then um, my, if you imagine our proficiency rubric, um, I have a breakdown. So. It's all decimals and crazy specific, but essentially it breaks down to four is an A, three is a B, two is a C, one is a D. Insufficient evidence is an F. Um, and so my grade book then takes from each power standard, averages both power standards, and spits out a grade based on my decimal breakdown. It's then you just enter into IC for like mid quarter, quarter. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll enter in, because parents like to see it, I'll enter in the grade on the quiz, and then I'll also enter the current grade. So they know every two weeks <laughs> where they stand in class as far as the letter grade. Just It just helps as far as communication. So it's not a, I mean, I don't want it to be a surprise ever. Like, oh, I thought this was a C, but I have an F. So my infinite campus is pretty, it's just a quiz grade and then current grade. And then the next quiz grade and the next quiz grade. Can you put in the same thing? For each individual quiz you can put that, you put a letter or a number grade for that? Yes, sir. Yes. Often, more often. Well, does it just make sense to like, yeah, it's good. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that would be especially with the spiraling. So, my, my, for each standard, each standard is a decaying average. 
and then I take the average of those for my power standard, and then average my power standard for a credit card. But just made it because I was already entering all that. Well, my TA were entering all that stuff in, and it's a lot. Of structure and so then to convert it to infinite campus, I didn't want to. Is that a great? It doesn't communicate it very well. It doesn't look good. The parents are understanding it, so I'm like, I'm not going to spend all that time on that. And the string tracker was a much better communication. Most definitely. Well, the students are doing all that. So it was a kind of a beast to set up IT, so that when you put in a score, it tries to do all this weird stuff. So all I did was, I did some development as a non-working class and then the current grade as the only one that's on this grade, and I just entered it as a I we so 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 that they can just like see their formative kind of where they are at. Then I can track the penalized kids' grades go like that. I can figure that one out. And then I get kind of see the stuff in there, and I'm like, let's see something you see in your very close. So I need to like. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll make sure that we post the presentation on Google Classroom. Um, yeah. And it'll have links to yeah. both so the resources. Feel free to comment on the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so break and then panel at 11.30, yeah. right? Where panel at 11.30. Panel, what was it? The quad area, 1345 to 1337. So this is 47. Would 45 be? Translated that into this way. Do you want to go?